What's up YouTube, it's your boy Rhett, back at it again with another video. In my best video of all time about the Gemini API, where I show you how to buy Bitcoin automatically for the lowest fees of any cryptocurrency exchange, we actually use AWS to automate the Bitcoin purchases. And some of the people in the comments have complained to me about how complicated that video is. They say, Rhett, that video is so complicated. And then I make fun of them in videos like this. But then one commenter pointed out that it's not that the tutorial is too hard to follow, it's actually that I'm a giant pretentious because I didn't explain what AWS was, why we needed to use it, if it was safe or anything like that. So in this video, we're gonna be going over what AWS is, how to sign up for an AWS account. We go through what Lambda functions and CloudWatch are, which are the functions in AWS that we're actually using over in that Gemini video. And then finally, I explain the AWS free tier and actually show you how all of the services that we use over in that Gemini video actually fall into the permanent free tier in AWS. This video might end up being really long, but I I did my best to pack it full of information and make it really your one-stop shop for learning about AWS in the context of that Gemini video. Obviously no single video on the internet can explain what AWS is because AWS is a f monster, it's so big. That being said, feel free to skip around in the timeline down below to the parts that are most relevant to you. Smash the like button for cloud computing and let's level up your brain. <laughs> So first, what is AWS? AWS actually stands for Amazon Web Services and it's Amazon's cloud computing platform. I feel like whenever someone says cloud computing platform, I just go, Rhett, what the f is a cloud computing platform? Can you just f speak English? So on your computer and on my computer, we have stuff like graphics cards and CPUs and other little hardware components that make the computer work. And even bigger computers have those same elements and those big computers are locked away somewhere in a data center and they might have lots of of storage space and load balancers and fancy networking components and all sorts of other crazy computer stuff. A cloud platform basically allows you to at home with your little laptop access all of those crazy fancy computer infrastructure things that used to be previously locked away in giant computers and data centers. But now that power to access some of those components has been democratized by Amazon and Google and Microsoft and some of these other cloud computing companies. And now you can access those resources from the comfort of your own home with your little laptop. So you don't actually have to own a data center anymore to have access to these complex computing systems. You can actually just sign up for AWS and then rent those resources through the cloud from Amazon. And the cloud is basically just the internet. I'll show you later on in the video why it was important that we actually use AWS for that Gemini Bitcoin solution and what it actually would have looked like if we had tried to do that on a computer by ourselves. Pretty much everyone knows Amazon as amazon.com, the giant e-commerce website, but not a lot of people know that AWS is actually a really significant part of Amazon's business. If we look at how Amazon makes its money, a large percent of the revenue, actually more than half, comes from Amazon.com, the e-commerce store, which is not really a big surprise. However, there are lots of costs to operating a giant e-commerce business at the scale of Amazon. So even though Amazon.com generates more than half of Amazon's yearly revenue, AWS actually makes more operating income, which is basically revenue minus the cost to actually create that revenue. AWS actually creates more operating income, even though it only makes up 12% of the revenue of Amazon. And that's because a business like AWS scales a lot better, the costs don't grow linearly, versus an e-commerce store. If you want to grow your e-commerce business, you might need more warehouses and more inventory, and you need to hire more employees to manage the inventory. But if you're just scaling up your cloud infrastructure business, you don't really have those same variable costs that are associated with scaling. It's much more scalable to be doing something that you only have to build it once and then it makes you money forever. And the costs to scaling up and acquiring a new customer are actually less than the costs of acquiring the last customer. You want something where the costs decrease over time because you're getting to reuse a lot of the assets that you've already purchased versus something like building a giant e-commerce store that doesn't really scale very well. The costs actually increase non-linearly with the number of products that you decide to sell and the number of people that you decide to sell to. This is definitely over simplifying the problem, but if you think about Netflix, which is a customer of AWS, if they want a little more cloud computing space, Amazon just needs to allocate more 
computing space in one of their giant data centers somewhere around the world that they've already built out to Netflix's account infrastructure. And as companies like Netflix and Samsung and Comcast and BMW continue to collect more data and need more computing throughput in their businesses, they're all going to come back to Amazon or Microsoft or Google. In that case, all of those customers are Amazon customers. They're going to come back to Amazon and say, hey, we need more computing space to do this. Or, hey, we have this manual process that we want to turn into an automated process and we want to offload some of this on-site computing hardware that we have into an AWS cloud infrastructure, Amazon's going to say, sweet, we've already got the computing space for you to do that. It's not really going to cost us a linear amount more to scale you up and build out this new solution. And so Amazon is happy to take that business and the margins are actually really good compared to something like e-commerce, which is sort of a race to the bottom, basically. If you're interested in learning more about the history of AWS and Amazon in general, I highly recommend the book, The Everything Store by Brad Stone. I listened to it on Audible a couple years ago and it gave me a really deep appreciation for Jeff Bezos' ability to prioritize long-term thinking and then also to continue to evolve Amazon from an online bookstore into the cloud computing behemoth that it is today. I'll leave a link to that book down in the description and also a link for you to sign up for Audible Premium Plus. When you sign up, you can get up to two free books, including The Everything Store, the book that we just talked about. Audible is one of my favorite ways to learn new things and I've been a customer since 2017. So definitely give it a try, especially if you've never done something like listen to audiobooks. It's a really great service. I was super skeptical when I first started, but I'm actually really into it now. Next, let's go ahead and talk about how to sign up for AWS. One of the common questions from the last video was, I have an Amazon account already. Does that mean that I can log into AWS with my existing Amazon account? And actually, no, you can't. They're two totally separate logins. So over here, when you're logging into Amazon, the e-commerce store, you have to actually create an entirely separate login to get access to AWS. So right now I'm going to take you through step-by-step step making a new AWS account. If you already do have an account, feel free to skip to the next section of the video. So I'm actually just going to do this right here on mobile just to show you how easy this is. First, you're going to go to aws.amazon.com. Once you're on aws.amazon.com, you're going to click up on the three lines up there in the top right and hit sign into console down at the bottom. You're going to hit create a new AWS account. You're going to provide an email address. You're going to create a password and then you're going to name your AWS account. You can name this really whatever you want and you can change it whenever you want also. So let's hit continue here. You can choose whether you're going to use this account for business or for personal. I'm going to say business in this instance, but my other account is a personal account. So go ahead and choose whichever option fits best for you and then just fill out this information here. Once you fill out that information, go ahead and click continue to step 205. And so here on the third step, you're actually going to have to provide credit card or debit card information. Like I'll show you later in this video, all of the functions that we actually use in the Gemini API are completely free. It does say here that they will charge you one dollar as a hold while they verify your identity but once you have verified your AWS account you're actually not going to have to pay anything if you use AWS in the way that I've described in the Gemini video there are lots of functions in AWS that will cost you something so definitely be careful and if you are seeing anything weird show up on your credit card statement definitely go check out the billing section of AWS and see which service you're using and what you're being charged for so here I'm just gonna add a credit card next I'm gonna give them a mobile phone number and fill out the security check and have them send me an SMS, verified the code. And so here you're going to select a support plan. This is basically, if you have questions with AWS, you're gonna reach out to either basic support, developer support, or business support. Obviously, if you were someone like Netflix, you would want business support, right? Because they need to make sure that Netflix is running all the time. For your little Gemini API script, you know, you don't need 24 seven Amazon support probably. So you're gonna be good with the free basic support. So let's click free there and uh, complete sign up. Congratulations, thank you for signing up for AWS. So this is really it. This was a super simple sign up process. One or two questions maybe you might get tripped up on there, but overall very, very simple. And now once you click go to the AWS management console, you're going to log in and that was it. Now you're into AWS, okay? So we just signed up for AWS, brand new account in probably five minutes. I think most people will just be suspicious at having to fill out credit card information on something that I am claiming to be free. I can show you my billing statement here for the last, you know, however many months I've been using AWS and hopefully you'll see that I haven't been charged anything at all. And as we 
go later on into the video, you're gonna see exactly why that is and the number of requests and the number of resources that we actually get totally for free just from signing up for AWS. And it's actually enough to fully execute all of the stuff in that Gemini video. And it's gonna be enough for some of the other tutorials that I'm gonna be making in the future that are just related to using Lambda functions and using CloudWatch to automate those Lambda functions. So as for AWS services that we're gonna use, first let's check out Lambda functions, which basically allows us to host a Python script up in the AWS cloud environment. In the Gemini example, we hosted both our buy script and our transfer script as Python functions in AWS. This allows us to execute this Python function to either buy Bitcoin or transfer the Bitcoin to an external wallet inside of Amazon's cloud infrastructure, rather than having to set up some Python environment locally on our computers and having to either automate that script locally every day or having to just manually run that script every day. No one wants to do it manually. So instead of setting up that entire local development environment for Python, I actually just set up my own local Python and developer environment, use Docker to containerize that environment, and then put that into the layer.zip that's up on the Notion page where I'm hosting all of the code for the Gemini API. This is better than doing this on your computer also because your computer's probably not on 24 hours a day. And there might actually be entire days where like maybe your battery dies and you aren't using your computer that day and you wish that your computer would buy Bitcoin for you, but it's dead and you forgot to charge it. And you don't even know that it's dead. Maybe you just didn't plug it in and you went out and enjoyed your life for a day, but you wanted to buy Bitcoin. Now you didn't get to do that because your file was hosted locally on a computer. Luckily, AWS basically never goes down because Amazon has people working on it 24 seven across the globe. And so that script is pretty much never going to fail. And you don't need to make sure that something is turned on. It's just gonna work. Also, let's say the Python script was hosted on your local laptop and you accidentally threw your laptop into the ocean. Now that Python script is gone, but because it's hosted up in AWS, you can actually log into AWS from any computer in the world and then execute that Lambda function that you have stored up in AWS. The next question that a lot of people have is, okay, that sounds really great, Rhett. I am dropping my computer in the ocean all the time, so this is gonna solve a lot of my problems, but this seems really insecure compared to just having this script on my one laptop. I don't really trust Amazon and what if I get hacked and all these other questions about security, right? So with AWS, just like any other service you use where you're storing important information, you should be setting up two-factor authentication either with some sort of hardware device or with your phone through Google Authenticator or 1Password or Authy. And that's going to deter 99% of attackers, maybe more than 99, maybe like 99.999% of attackers. But let's say that someone somehow was able to access your AWS account or if they grabbed your Gemini credentials off of your screen or something, they took a picture and now they have access to trade on your behalf within Gemini or within Coinbase Pro or one of these other exchanges. They would be able to execute trades on your behalf and in the case of Coinbase Pro, they would be able to automatically deposit money from your linked bank account into Coinbase Pro. But luckily with a lot of these exchanges, there is built-in functionality to the exchanges to stop them from withdrawing your cryptocurrency from the exchange to some wallet that you don't control. And that setting is named something different in a lot of these different exchanges, but it should be something like allow whitelisting or withdraw whitelisting. And what that whitelist does is it says, if the address is not on this whitelist of pre-approved addresses that we can make withdrawals to, do not execute any withdrawal under any circumstances. So if I'm a malicious actor and I hijack your API credentials, I can't withdraw your Bitcoin to my Bitcoin address because it's not on your list of approved withdrawal addresses. And so the next obvious question is, well, why can't I, the malicious hacker, just add that address to the list of approved addresses and withdraw it immediately. And that's because on these exchanges to add a new address to the withdrawal whitelist, you actually have to wait. Seven days is the amount of time that I've seen most frequently, but it might change exchange to exchange, just depending on what their security policies are. But on Gemini, it's seven days. And so within those seven days, you will have received an email that someone suspicious has logged into your account. You will have received emails that they placed all these trades on your behalf. You will have received emails that they added a new address to the withdrawal whitelist. And in those seven days, you should be able to regain access to your account and stop those withdrawals from happening by removing those new withdrawal addresses from the withdrawal whitelist. So that was a little bit about Lambda functions and about the security of storing these Lambda functions up on AWS. Next, let's talk about CloudWatch and how we're automating these Lambda functions that we've written. CloudWatch is basically just a way that allows you to schedule the running of these different Lambda functions that you've already written within AWS. And it's great for our use case because it means that we can automate any API call that we want. All we have to do is make a small 
small script executing the simple API task that we want to have happen, and then go over to CloudWatch and automate that on some regular schedule. In this case, in the Gemini video, we're buying Bitcoin either daily or weekly or monthly. You can really make it whatever you want to do, and CloudWatch makes it very simple for you to do that. The alternative to using CloudWatch and the Lambda functions would be something like setting up your own computer that's running 24 seven in your house, drawing electricity all the time, and then setting up a batch scheduler on that computer to execute these functions. And even that, it's more expensive, it's more cumbersome, but it's still not as good, right? If your electricity goes out and that computer dies, or if that computer overheats and is unusable for the rest of time, maybe it got melted or your dog ate it or you threw it in the ocean. Point is, if that physical hardware is damaged, you need to get a new one. If Amazon's physical hardware is damaged, nothing happens. You continue to for free execute these scripts and all you have to do is host them up in the cloud. Next, let's jump into the free tier and take a look at why CloudWatch and why Lambda functions are actually totally free for the use case that we've defined here of buying Bitcoin every day with Gemini. So as you can see here, I have the free tier up in front of you and I'll leave a link down in the description to the free tier so you can check this out for yourself. There's actually the first year free tier and the always free tier, which is a little like tricky, right? Like they get you by promoting these things free for a year. And I was actually worried that they might make Lambda functions or CloudWatch not free after a year. But if you go into the always free tier, you'll see for CloudWatch, we have 10 custom metrics and alarms, which we don't even use in our implementation. So we're using zero. And then for Lambda functions, we have a million requests per month, which like unless you bought Bitcoin 10,000 times a day, you're never going to hit that amount just from implementing the Gemini strategy. If you guys do ever have questions about what is included in the free tier, I'll leave the link again down in the description. You can check out if you're watching this video a year from now or six months from now, is the free tier the same as what I mentioned in this video? I hope this video was helpful for you guys. I really did feel like a complete when that commenter told me that he didn't understand what AWS was and to get my foot out of my basically. So if this was helpful for you guys, please go down and leave it a like so that we can spread this video on YouTube to the other people who need to learn about AWS. I think AWS and cloud computing in general are a massive skill that I think 30 years from now, a lot of people are going to know and it's going to make us look like complete boomers, basically. If you guys want to implement that Gemini buy script that I've been talking about for this entire video, I'll leave a link up in the cards here. So definitely go check that out if you are interested in the definitive best way to buy Bitcoin in the world right now. Leave a comment down below if something I said was confusing or if you have any questions about anything we talked about today in this video, I do still respond to all the comments. And then subscribe and hit the notification bell for new videos every Monday at 10 a.m. Eastern. I love you all. Goodbye.